motoring now. I think it's really motoring along, you know. Yeah, it sounds like more drive there and less of that um, uncomfortable kind of toppy end, isn't it, you know? The basic idea of, of coming into the, the mastering room is to look at the sound, what's recorded there, and think, hmm, you know, I want to try and make it stronger or clearer or... And obviously go for volume, because it's got to be played am amongst other records. You don't want it to go Bleh. between tracks. You want it to actually stand up as strong as the rest of them. Even if you haven't worked at Air Studios or Abbey Road, you want to try and at least have the similar quality. So what we do with all equalisation here is pull areas forward and try and give it more control of sound so it doesn't sound weak anywhere and it always sounds rich quality wise um, if say you're putting loads of top and there's loads of hiss being built up on it you use a filter to try and diminish that area of hiss so when it comes in it doesn't come in like psh, it comes in like tuk, tuk, tuk. it's attacking you know it's coming at you and you say oh it could have be recorded abbey road or whatever a good quality studio you don't want it to sound cheap in a computer situation at home, guys got little boxes and that, and you can go through boxes and, and improve sounds and that. But if you haven't got the volume to work with, again, it's that volume thing. You need volume to hear how far you can go for the depth, the width, the whole thing, really. You're looking at a, a quality of sound. And if you've got all the good goodies there on the desk and you can't play loud, you, you, you're fighting yourself to try and draw out what you can. That's why you come to a mastering house to say, well, what can we do with this? And we've got loads of knobs to tweak, loads of filtering, you know, loads of control in general, you know, and try and draw out everything from the track, you know. Some of the guys work in the bedrooms and they can't turn the volume up to see what's happening in the sound, you know, they're, they're limited to volume. And of course, volume, you can hear things moving more and then you can adjust accordingly, you know. But in the bedroom situation, obviously, the neighbours don't like it. So they've got smaller speakers, poor lads, you know. So they're pushing it as far as they can, you know, to try and get the best sound out of it. And of course, when you get on big speakers, oh, I don't remember hearing that's so good as that, you know. Exactly. Yeah, get it louder, yeah. Because volume is the exciting, gets adrenaline going, doesn't it? You know, we know, you know, louder the better. Whoa. <laughs> People say to me, You're lucky you listen to music all day. I says, Half the time, I'll listen to the music in the evening, possibly, because while you're listening to the day, you're listening to the skeleton of it, you know, what it's made up of, all the different areas, and how you can make each one blend with another one, and it doesn't overshadow or, or kill the, what the, the actual mix is there. If the bass is a bit loosey, tighten. If the top's a bit light, maybe a bit of edge, you know, all helping hands. So the guy hears his record and goes, I like that. You know, it's my song, and it's just helped a bit more, you know, expand this. How long have you been doing this? Cutting records, oh gosh, started the late 60s. Um, I worked for um, the Beatles at Savile Row. <laughs> it's a good starting block, isn't it, really? Um, it's a good experience. But um, I went into balance engineering but came back to cutting because I, I got more of a, a buzz out of the, the cutting side because you make an instant decision. <laughs> Here, you make a decision, and it's that decision now, and that's the one you've got to go for. You've got to be impressed by that moment in time. You switch it and go, yeah, it's doing what I want from that track. It's getting the track up there, and it's, comp it's going to compete with everything else that's around there. Yeah. And it's an instant decision that you want to do. And the guy goes out, and he's like, wow, that didn't take too long, you know. But if you're mixing, it can be uh, through the night, and you can walk out at 8 o'clock in the morning and go, I hope that's the best mix we've got. <laughs> yeah. It's an American um, limiter that was, blimey, must go back to the 50s, I think, when it was probably made. Um, but it's it just kind of, it's like a valve amp inside of it, and it gets hold of the sound and projects the sound, but doesn't, you, when you hear compressors, the, the today's compressors, the, the transistor versions, you hear them pulling, grabbing hold of the sound and, and not letting it move any further. But with the Fairchild, it does that, but it also makes it feel as though it's moving forward as well, so it's not a compression pulling you backwards, it's open, expanding the feel of it, you know. So when you put it in, you go, oh yeah, it gives a oomph down there. The way, it's the word I use, oomph, because that's what it sounds like to me, like it gives more oomph. If somebody says, oh, it's so-and-so frequency, it's so-and-so frequency, it doesn't feel like that, it just feels like it's getting there, you know. And when you hear it played out in dance floors now, you can always feel the bass end pushing out there, Beautiful, you know, round but kicking, you know. Do you think that the um, quality of records made has got better and better and better since you've been in this? Or 
I think the sound quality, yeah, um, there's a lot of performance on earlier records and, well, back, I mean, performance was all. If you, if you look at bands like, say, Slade, mm. theirs was basically like a live set in the studio and the records accordingly sounded live and you'd hear, you know, Noddy's voice coming at you, you go, oh, wow, you know, puts it with performance. <laughs> I mean, that was it, it was performance, you see, whereas nowadays people can spend more time doing voices and, and they've got a little bit that, that kind of bit flooded out of it here and they put a revoice it again and they'll put it all together. That's become more robotic in this way, you know, instead of being like, yeah, go on, go for it, yeah. switch the red lights on and they go, give it everything. But as soon as you put the red lights on, it'd be nervous, I don't want to go flat, I don't want to be out of tune. And yeah. it stiffens the artist up and his performance is stiffened accordingly, you know. I mean, when I used to do balance years ago, we never tell, never put the red lights on. We'd just say, "Now do it again. Go on, let go. Let's see what you can put down. We'd record it. Yeah. <laughs> that was always a good performance, yeah. you know. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> Sneaky. <Sorry. laughs> you know the Neumann microphones? Yeah. Well, the Neumann have made this machine um, as well. It's a, what you call a cutting lathe. And... What it does basically, um, it advances across in that motion there, cutting a groove in there, or slower than that obviously, but it, it produces a groove by this head here. It's got a stylus on the end which causes a vibration, introduces sound into vibration. And what happens, it, we revolve it and the suction is held through this bit here onto the turntable, depending on the size of the disc. This is a 14 inch one, which is two inches bigger all around for handling purposes so we don't damage the, the actual groove. And that, that suction there holds it down rigid. So when it's cutting the groove into there, there's no move, no sliding, no moving. And it actually introduces a, a groove, depending on, like this is gonna be a 12 inch 45, it'll be nice and deep. So we put lots more volume than we could on say a 13, 14 minute side. We'd have to go to 33 and be aware of like, you know, it's a bit shallower, so careful of the groove. Because we put too much volume into a shallow groove, what happens, you get this and it skips across nicely. And the DJs go, oh, that was a short record. <laughs> Neumann stopped making them all a good 10, 15 years ago um, because there was that big thing in the papers about CDs are superseding vinyl, vinyl is dying, vinyl is over, and vinyl never really went away. It just may have slowed down here and there, but it's, it's coming on a resurgence again, you know. Because all the independents love vinyl, a lot of the DJs like vinyl because it gives them access to the whole industry. You can get a 7 inch record out there, it's like a sample of what you've got on your, your album to be or your 12 inch. Like it's a selling block, you know. I think it's very important that the little guys get a chance to be seen to be heard. As you can imagine, hundreds are going down each day to the factory and uh, the catalogue number designates that it belongs to a record label being NUT, no U-turn, 28 is your release 28, and, it, and A's and B's, which side goes in the metal part, goes top and bottom plate to squeeze the plastic and introduce the labels, because that's, that's the format they, they demand, you know, some kind of numbering system. Yeah. It's a code, it's a matrix code, you know. <laughs> You're happy when you finish the job and the guy rings up and says, oh, it sounds great, thanks, you know. And at that moment, you, it put you that much off the floor because somebody said thank you and they were pleased. So all the effort you've put in there is like all for the good, really, you know. Okay, so we're going to cut one now, do a master. So I'll set it all up and then you see what happens. Because at the end of the day, it's got to sound good. <laughs> Doesn't want to sound like an old record, it's a new record. <laughs> I mean, it's we're doing it for the sake of the music and having a smile on our faces where it's like... I think a lot of people do it for the money, and I think if you're doing it for the money, it's not the same anyway, is it, Nico? You know, you've yeah. got to do it for the love of music, you know. What happens? If, what do you mean about doing it for the money? Well, you get some people they're trying to calculate how much you're going to make out of it. And, I mean, to me, it's, it's not that situation. You should be calculating how much pleasure you can give people. You know, pleasure first, money afterwards. If you get if you sell a record and it's something you really love doing, and then you get thousands of pounds coming, it's like, oh wow, that's like a bonus. Because you give the track to people and, you, and people are pleasured by it, you know, going, wow, I love your record. And then suddenly a wad of money comes in. It's like, wow, it's twofold, isn't it? But don't do it the other way around. Do it for the money only. Do it for the love of music, you know. That's what I think. <laughs>